Hello, everybody. This is Dr. David Berger of Holistic Pediatrics and Family Care in Tampa, Florida. Um, it's been a while since I've posted any videos or done much blogging, but I thought that it would be a good idea for us to share my thoughts and concerns um, relative to the coronavirus COVID-19. Um, COVID and so um, I'm going to first go over um, just my kind of like lay of the land and my take on everything at this point. Um, also over the weekend, we did have um, people from our social media post um, questions and we will do a question and answer um, in that and uh, Emily, our office manager, will be asking the questions of me off screen and we will go through them all. Okay, so um, most important thing, of course, we all need to be taking consideration in the first place is that we should not be in panic mode right now. Um, you know, likelihood that we will, should really ever be in panic mode is probably very small and we'll get into that, but everybody should be taking a deep breath and then just not coughing on their neighbor right afterwards. But, you know, just so that you know, you know, we t people talk about the word coronavirus and then you hear people talk about COVID 2019. So coronavirus is a family of viruses, just like there's different herpes viruses, different flu viruses, etc. And so these are all different types of strains. So coronaviruses themselves make up approximately 25 percent of the common cold. Um, this um, COVID 2019 is a little bit different. Not that we know that it's any more dangerous than other coronaviruses, but more because since this is a novel or therefore new to human beings infection, nobody prior to 2020 had protection against this virus. And therefore, the potential for widespread of the virus is increased if there's no immunity for anybody. So that's an important point to take into, consult, into, into account. Also, while there is work on a vaccine at this point, um, the, um, the CDC and the FDA are talking about being 12 to 18 months away. Um, we are hearing in Israel that they are a few weeks away, so stay tuned on that. But we need to be um, to presume that for at least the rest of this current viral season, that there won't be any vaccine that will be available in order to um, provide additional protection to society. It should be pointed out that most cold and flu viruses um, do peak more in the wintertime. And so even when people get through this current um, and into the summer, the likelihood that we would see it um, rebound again next fall into winter is most likely there. And again, we obviously won't know until time, um, time plays through on that. Um, just also as this kind of like a starting word of where to get advice from besides here. So I do believe and from everything that I've seen um, that the information that's being handed out, uh, passed out by the CDC, as well as by county and state um, health departments does seem very um, accurate. Okay. For the most part, I am seeing the information on the news um, as being accurate as well. Um, I do see when people, um, there are stories about who, uh, some over responses, such as you may have heard people, there's somebody suggesting people drink bleach, of course, a terrible idea. But I also do see the news articles kind of calling those things out and not offering them up just as advice. So my general recommendation is listen to the health professionals, not politicians. Um, okay. So once we get to the point where people have immunity, then it'll probably be like other colds. Now, a couple of things regarding this particular virus. Although we are hearing that there is a 2% um, death rate, this is of people who are confirmed positive with the virus, and the only people who are being tested are people who are sick. So we don't know how many people who are out there who have had just mild regular cold symptoms or could potentially be even be asymptomatic carriers of it. And so the the more likely, and of course, time will tell as the research comes out. But when we talk about the death, you know, the death rate for measles is 0.2%. For the flu, it's 0.1% of people who catch the disease. And my suspicion is we're probably going to be more in those types of numbers. But of course, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't be following all the precautions that are necessary to prevent spread. Because even though we may be a healthy person, we of course don't want to pass it along to somebody who is immunocompromised or who has other chronic conditions. So all of the things that we've all known about um, that we've talked about for flu prevention and everything else, such as, you know, proper hand washing for 20 seconds with with with, wa with soap and water, um, using a at least 60 percent alcohol um, um, hand gel. If you if you can't wash your hands, you know, of course, coughing into your elbow, not into your hands, not touching your hands. And if you do washing your hands um, or sanitizing them before touching other people, not being out in public if you have a fever or at least for 24 hours after the fever is over. 
That means not going to school, not going to work, etc. But realistically, all of the precautions that we've heard for the flu for all of these years, you can realistically take the word influenza out and insert the word coronavirus, and it's going to be the same recommendations. While let's talk in terms of testing for the virus. Now, this is an evolving thing. The Florida Department of Health just um, this weekend came out with a with new um, recommendations, which is similar to what the CDC is saying, but we're not talking at this point of doing universal testing for anybody who has a cold. It's really that um, there are situations that if you've traveled to a place where it's been spreading and then you have a fever um, and um, respiratory symptoms, or if you've been exposed to somebody who's known and have a fever and respiratory symptoms, that's who is supposed to be tested. Now, it, um, it is recommended that anybody calling our office or any other medical office to contact them ahead of time to let them know if you have a concern to see whether they want to even bring you in the first place. The realistic as to why people will come in to be tested for the flu or for strep for that matter is that there's something specific that can be done to go after that particular pathogen, whether it's Tamiflu for the flu, a penicillin or other antibiotic for um, a strep. But as we know at this point, there is no specific treatment for coronavirus. We'll talk about natural approaches and preventive approaches, in the, um, but in terms of from a mainstream medical perspective, there is nothing that we can do, of course, if a person is having breathing problems and the same thing that we would do with admitting somebody with a viral pneumonia or a viral bronchitis because they're dropping their oxygen levels or because they're having other signs of insignificant respiratory distress, which means fast breathing labored breathing, inability to catch one's breath, not in the midst of a cough, but in between coughs. Or of course, if you can't stop coughing at all, then that would be a concern, um, of course. And if there's with a fever, then there's more of a concern. And of course, in a proper healthcare facility, one can check for oxygen levels that are dropping. But again, there has to be those other respiratory significant symptoms seen for something to have um, oxygen compromise in the first place. Okay. Um, so in terms of our recommendations at Holistic Pediatrics and Family Care. So first and foremost, um, as many of you know, we do have an immune support protocol that we have available on our patient portal, as well as a flu article. And the flu article is going to be much more appropriate for this just because there's also discussions there about do prevention dosing of, of, of uh, against viral infections. Now, it should be, of course, very clear that this has not been anything that's been studied in any kind of research. This this is based upon 20 plus years of my experience as a pediatrician who have been successfully treating people and from everything that we've heard relative to what diseases out in the community, we consistently see far fewer cases of any of the diseases that are reported out in the community, whether it's rotavirus or influenza virus or anything else. And it seems as if our approach with doing things like making sure vitamin D levels and zinc levels are optimized, starting the immune support protocol and other and supporting supplements on the first signs of illness, everything that we should ask ourselves is what is the potential risk versus what is the potential benefit and the fortunate thing is that the supplements that we talk about the danger is like pretty much non-existent so if there's a potential benefit even if it's not a clear benefit but the risk is low when we're weighing that scale of benefit versus risk that's what allows us to feel comfortable with recommending the um to use these supplements in the first place but it should absolutely not be told to anybody that this is something that we've proven that is going to work for any virus let alone for this particular coronavirus since it hasn't been around then i can't t say that i've treated anybody with it now is it possible that someone's had a mild cold that we just didn't know about it maybe this has been around longer than we thought who knows? But at the same time, we just don't want to be making assumptions and overstating what our situation is. So these are safe supplements that can be used to boost the immune system. And there are, thing, and there are ways of using them as well in more of a prevention mode. I will talk more about those specifics in the Q&A because I have pre-screened those questions. OK, so but it's also important to recommend that, um, you know, other things that we want to recommend people is, of course, avoiding unnecessary antibiotics, bronchitis, unless in smokers are viral infections. So if anybody gets prescribed an antibiotic by a doctor, the most important question to ask them is, why do you think that this is a bacteria and not a viral infection? It's unfortunate that not all doctors are actually asking themselves that question, but that's the ultimate question. And it's a very, very fair question that I don't think any doctor would actually argue that, um, but you never know. Um, but it is also recommended, um, I mean, identified that the CDC says that 50% of antibiotics in this country were not necessary that are being prescribed right now. So that's a very big number. And of course, all the problems with antibiotics in terms of resistance and knocking out good flora need to be taken into consideration as well. 
And knowing the importance of having a healthy gut microbiome, the flora there, in terms of our overall immune system, if we're killing off those bacteria unnecessarily, then of course we are potentially leading to worsening immune status for that individual. Okay, so what are the, the particular things that we're recommending? Number one, if you haven't had your vitamin D level checked and, and taken care of, getting your 25 hydroxy vitamin D level above 50. A level of 30 seems to be fine for bone health, but above 50 seems to be more advantageous for immune health. Maintaining a plasma zinc level above 90 micrograms per deciliter. Um, that's again on a blood testing. Um, I know that the labs will say somewhere down in the 40s and 50s and 60s are acceptable, but even when there's not viral infections that are going on, we still don't really, um, we still want to get those zinc levels just for general preventive health. Of course, using the immune support protocols um, that we have on our um, patient portal. Um, also, because I realized that this message is going to be getting to the um, larger community, we are finalizing and reworking all of those documents that we aim to have them posted on social media and our website by the end of the week because um, we recognize that it's important, especially since people don't have a lot of information on prevention and other treatments that we felt it was our responsibility to be able to share with the um, community as much as we can, just in case it can and potentially spare morbidity and mortality. Okay, and then of course we hear about the masks. Okay, so there is a mask that you may have heard about called the N95 that is a surgical mask, and it's being recommended to use it that if you have the illness, have symptoms of an illness, I should say, that you to prevent you exposing to other people or people who are in close contact with you, whether it's family members, other caregivers, or of course, a medical provider who is doing an exam, they should be protected themselves. But it is definitely not recommended, nor has it shown to prevent anything, at this point anyways, to be using universal masks. Now, could there be particular um, situations, such if a person is on an airplane or a bus, where there is a, a lot of people in close contact with each other? Um, and the air is recirculating within that area, then could that potentially be an area? And would I have a major problem if a person wanted to wear a mask while on an airplane? I wouldn't have any arguments with that. But also recognizing that these masks are, are not um, reusable because, you know, they're disposable. And, you know, there is a supply issue right now. Um, we are ourselves, we were able to get some boxes of it, but there is a lot of concern that the healthcare professionals and those in need, as I described, as to who really should be wearing a mask won't be able to get them because everybody has bought them out. So I realize that everybody's wanting to protect themselves. They want to protect their family. I understand that. But we also need to be judicious about how we're approaching this if we really want to prevent world, um, you know, further spread of this. And of course, the people who are sick and the people who are exposed who are sick are the people we really need to be focusing on from that prevention of passage. But it is also understood that, at least at this point, that two to three people will catch it from any one person who has symptoms already. So that's kind of how the spread will go. I do anticipate that those numbers, again, will change as the year to two goes on and people have more immunity. But at least that's what they're reporting right now. Okay, so in a nutshell, what do I think? That I think that we need to be keeping close monitor on this, listening to our healthcare officials. Um, you know, we will probably hear, we will hear more sicknesses. We will hear more deaths. We heard of one over the weekend in the United States. Um, but at the same time, we should be thinking this as just a, you know, a bad um, form of flu and take the precautions that we need to. But obviously the overwhelming majority of people who catch the flu, it's a mild illness or they recover. People don't die left and right, nor do we expect this to happen. But of course, anybody who does have immunocompromised, whether it's people who have like viral induced um, asthma, whether it's people who have other immunodeficiencies, whether it's senior citizens or people who have chronic lung diseases, chronic heart diseases, chronic kidney diseases, people who have other immune system dysregulations, those are going to be the people who are going to be at more at risk for a, for a more serious course of the disease. Um, and of course, because this is such an evolving story, you know, keep up with it, check that, you know, you know, see what the CDC is putting out um, daily. Um, the state of Florida just put out a very, very good um, um, couple of documents. As you may have heard, um, Governor DeSantis did declare a state of emergency today. This does not mean that we're impending doom, just like we set um, a emergency when there's a hurricane coming. And that's more so that funds can be available and that workers can be available and, and mobilized in such a case in case there is a need for that. But just the fact that we're under a state of emergency does not mean anything more than when we're under emergency for hurricane preparedness at this point. 
Okay, so with this, I am now going to ask Emily if she could provide us with some questions um, that you guys have submitted. And uh, of course, we will try to hit as many as we can. Okay, wonderful. So a couple of questions you did cover already. Um, the first one here that we see is, since it is a respiratory infection, should we be taking the supplement NAC? And if so, can we give the supplement to our children? Okay, so NAC is N-acetylcysteine. N-acetylcysteine does break up mucus if a person has mucus. They can even inhale it. That's what people with cystic fibrosis does. Taking it by mouth, I have no, no evidence that that would actually do anything at this point. Um, it's a safe thing to take, but I don't really see the point of it. Um, one thing that it can be helpful for is since since cysteine is the precursor to glutathione, which the body's, which is the body's most important for regulating um, Im immune overreactions it's an inflammation. But in terms of do we have any evidence whatsoever that that would be doing anything for this? No, I don't. And it's also not something that I have as part of my routine immune support protocol. Okay. How to prevent and then support the immune system? It's a good question. So kind of as I alluded to before, this is everything that we're currently stating on our current document about the flu that's on the website now, and which we will be updating later this week to be a little bit more universal to include coronavirus. But everything that we talked about in terms of those preventive um, approaches from a supplement perspective, from a treatment perspective, um, when sick, um, I would encourage people to follow. Does elderberry exasperate cytokine storms and respiratory infections? If so, what would you recommend to support the immune system or nothing at all? That's a very good question. So first of all, a cytokine storm. So whenever we get an infection or other in thing that stimulates our immune system, cytokines are produced. These are immunomodulators. Um, and so they are responsible for create, you know, for helping dictate the immune response of our bodies. However, when cytokines get too much, then that's what causes symptoms and can cause significant symptoms. So when a person gets a virus and they're getting a runny nose, that's not the virus itself that's pouring out of their body. It's the mucus that is a response of our immune system through cytokines that that's as a response to that virus. So yes, there are some people who overreact to viruses, just like there are people who can have diabetes triggered by flu viruses. There are cases of autoimmunity being triggered by it, but there is absolutely no evidence that this particular virus causes any more of an issue. And as well as with elderberry, I actually did some research on this over the weekend for this question. I was able to find nothing credible whatsoever that elderberry um, stimulates a cytokine storm um, of any significance. I was able to find some anecdotal write-ups about it, um, people expressing concerns, but I, I found nothing of credible. By any chance, if you do find anything, please send it along to us. You know, we're, we're learning as we go as well, but I have not been able to find anything about that. But kind of keeping in mind with having things like the good vitamin D levels and the good zinc levels, that's all part of keeping the immune system from not over responding. So that's a lot of what we're trying to do is we're, we're not trying to immunosuppress people. Um, because, of course, that would cause other problems. And that's where things like steroids can come into big problems because it causes immunosuppression. But there are things like having good vitamin D levels and zinc levels that make it more of an immunomodulator. So it kind of doesn't let your immune system get too strong, while it also doesn't allow your immune system to, um, to be as weak. Thank you. We had a family write in, what are your thoughts on colloidal silver? We nebulize it, nebulize it as well as use nasal, nasal spray for viruses. And it has worked wonderfully. So this is something else that I did some research over the weekend. And again, I found, um, now I know people take it. I would have less of a concern with a person swallowing it because we have livers and such to deal with um, things that we enter our body. You know, there's gold treatments that are used for rheumatoid arthritis and, and autoimmune conditions. However, I was able to find nothing at all that says that nebulizing colloidal silver is safe. Um, you know, the lungs were developed to provide air exchange, not particle exchange. Um, I really would, would only recommend inhaling anything that's proven to be safe. So, you know, things like albuterol and saline, which the research has clearly shown these to be safe things. I'm perfectly in fine with inhaling that, but that, you know, but in terms of inhaling something that's actually a particulate, um, such as a heavy metal, we, again, we just do not know what um with the effects that that could be on the lungs you know as you may have heard as, as an aside you know for the the lung injuries that we were hearing about last summer from the from people vaporizing it turns out that those products for the, that were illegal they were being cut with a form of vitamin e that's totally totally safe for swallowing and totally safe for putting on your skin 
But it turns out that when it's inhaled, it actually damages people's lungs. And nobody knew that because nobody had ever thought of inhaling vitamin E. So we always have to be concerned about the unintended consequences. And at this point in time, I cannot endorse the inhaling of silver. Okay. What are your thoughts about giving reishi mushroom powder, echinacea drops, astragalus root drops, and licorice? Should this be given only when the child is sick or daily? Good question. So in terms of, you know, echinacea is one of the things that is part of our immune support protocol. Um, reishi mushrooms, um, astragalus, I mean, they certainly all have... Um, what appears to be beneficial effects with keeping an immune system strong. And again, with everything that we talked about, what's the risk versus benefit? And what's the benefit, what's the risk of taking a reishi mushroom? I find it hard to find any there unless a person's allergic to mushrooms or astragalus. Again, as long as a person's tolerating it, I don't see any danger in doing things. Of course, we could probably come up with a list of probably 50 other supplements that could one can make the same claim for. And of course, we have to be able to, how many things can we get into our body and afford and all of that should be taken into account. As far as licorice root itself, licorice root is not something that sheep people should be taking on a daily basis unless they're being followed by a doctor. Licorice root can slow down the breakdown of cortisol, elevating our cortisol levels, which can be an issue from an adrenal perspective over time. Licorice root is very good for when you do have mucus, when you do have a cold, when you do want to bring more of an anti-inflammatory response. So I have no problem using licorice root if the person is having a cough um, and, want, and wanting to see in, in a congestion and wanting to try to break that up some. But I wouldn't, especially since we may be dealing with the coronavirus um, for months still, and who knows what will go going forward, you know, hopefully it will... Um, it will fade as we get to the warmer months, but we don't have any proof of that. Um, but you know, anything that we that we shouldn't be taking long term, we need to take into consideration. And again, licorice root will be one of those. Um, my son has asthma. He is otherwise healthy, but his asthma is triggered by viruses. Should I be more concerned than the average parent of a healthy child without asthma? The answer, unfortunately, is yes. Um, but again, it will be the same answer again. Take the word coronavirus out and insert the word flu, and the same answer would be given. So yes, a person who has asthma, therefore they've had lung inflammation already, especially in a person who we know that viruses are the triggers. For some people, it's just cold or exercise, and that would not be the same concern. But if you know that viruses already trigger it, do I think that that's a potential? Doesn't mean it's going to happen, but do I think it's a potential that it could be a, that that child could be in for a worse course of it? I I, I think at least until we, until we have um, true research on this, but I think there's a highly likelihood that if there's problems with other viruses, that this would be a problem too. Could be. What is the treatment should one catch the virus? The news never talks about this. Some questions: What is the recovery rate? Is recovery dependent on heavy medical intervention as in the hospital, like needing? special medication, IV fluids, can a person be contagious if showing no symptoms? Wow, that's a lot of stuff. So first of all, you know, from a traditional medical perspective, it's just supportive care. If you need oxygen, you need oxygen. If you need a ventilator, ventilator God forbid, you need a ventilator. But there is no other treatments besides, again, the, the universal precautions, like going back to the hand washing that's and, and avoiding public places um, if you're sick, that really can be done um, for that. There's nothing to do it now. Again, using our first signs of illness protocol or the specific things for that we suggest using if you were to actually catch the flu would certainly be in order here. We do not know for sure what the recovery... I mean, if the recovery rate in terms of time seems to be along the lines of a regular cold. Of course, the more severe a person is if they get hospitalized, and I would expect that could, the recovery could take uh, be sooner. Um, but in, in terms of that, but in terms of the contagiousness, it is felt that a person could be contagious for up to two weeks, and that's why they're doing those two-week quarantines. Now, the level of contagiousness a person has is obviously very different based upon if they're coughing. They're sneezing. They're sharing. They're sharing the respiratory droplets with other people. Um, so um, that now, in terms of recovery, now again, most people who catch coronavirus is going to be a mild cold type of illness. Okay. So um, again, how are you defining recovery means that those people should recover just away from other colds. However, of course, if a person is in the hospital and they're on a ventilator then of course it's going to depend on, 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 on medical intervention because you wouldn't be on a ventilator or you wouldn't be needing supplemental oxygen unless you were really sick to begin with. But again, that's not going to be how most people are. IV fluids will be helpful if a person is dehydrated and they can't keep up with their oral fluids. 
but of course, oral rehydration solutions. Um, you know, we on the treating intestinal um, illness article on our patient portal actually talks about how one we can make the World Health Organization oral rehydration solution, which is of course Googleable as well, um, with using sea salt and um, um, I mean, to using salt and um, and just and rice in order to make a solution. But again, things like Gatorade, preferably the low sugar one, or some of the other health options that don't have the food colorings, of course, would be nice to have. Or they now have like the hydration tablets. I personally use the one from the company Noon N U U N um, that you just add to like um, you know 16 ounces of water, and then you have a solution right there. Um, and, and that's how I would approach it. But yeah, a person can be contagious of showing no symptoms, but they have to still be in, there still has to be an exposure of respiratory droplets. So I guess if a person had the virus inside their body and they were to fake cough on somebody, you know, but it wasn't just an induced cough, could that be enough to propel the virus somewhere? I guess in that situation, of course, we have no evidence of that one way or another, but certainly, you know, the person's going to be most contagious when they're febrile, right after they're febrile or when they're putting respiratory droplets into the air. Okay, so we'll have two more questions. We had a few inquiries about traveling. Should one delay their travel plans? Uh, if they do travel, what kind of mask to wear? What are your comments on that? Okay, so as far as a mask, there is only one mask that we are aware of at this point. There is um, development in Israel of two reusable masks that actually can be washed. Um, that in from early information that it actually may be more may be more protective. They're also going to be expensive, like probably a forty to fifty dollars per mask. Um, we are understanding that they will be available on Amazon. Um, who knows how quickly they'll sell out? Probably in thirty seconds. Um, but that's that. But as of right now, really there is only one option, which is the N95 mask. Um, in terms of travel, um, again, if you're, I wouldn't necessarily want to be traveling to an area of the world that has lots of cases of this, be it like in Italy, Iran, and and, and the places in Asia. Um, and again, you know, just being in less crowded environment. So, you know, being outside in a field at a festival is different than being inside at a convention hall, for instance, or where people are, are routinely going to be packed in together. Um, you know, but, you know, again, just use caution, follow your instincts. And obviously, if, um, you know, if your instincts tell you which, you know, which way you should do, you should follow them because, you know, I believe that the instincts of a person or, or a mom, you know, I tell people, I'll take my wife's, um, um, instincts over my own instincts when it comes to our kids, just because of that extra bond that moms have being tethered to the baby for, uh, for months, for nine to 10 months. Um, but, you know, following your instincts, you know, logic reasoning has gotten us pretty far as a society when we're actually utilizing it. It just amazes me how often that those wonderful skills are not implemented. Thank you. And we will end with the vaccine question. What criteria would make a vaccine a credible option? Okay, so you're probably not going to be shocked by this answer if it's safe, which of course can be a challenge because if they do come up with a vaccine and they put us on there, the likelihood that they will have the widespread testing done, such as vaccines that are already out there that's been done on hundreds of thousands of patients, that's not going to happen on up the bat because of course they need to give it to that many people and then it's not going to start off that much. What was the second part of that? What criteria would make a vaccine a credible option? Oh, so obviously that it works. So again, that's where the research needs to come into play and where they're just going to need to be doing testing. You know, what will they be doing monkey testing or other types of testing like they do before? It's going to be a very interesting question because I totally understand why there will be a rush to get something to market as soon as possible. So again, recognizing that even when things are done in small studies, um, until things are done in larger population studies, there's always the possibility of unintended consequences and more rare types types of side effects being seen when it's given to a larger number of people. But that would be the same comment that I would make for other vaccines and the same comment that I would make for pharmacological interventions as well. All right. So I know that that's a lot of information. I hope that I've been able to answer um, most of your questions out there. Um, please um, keep up with us on social media. Um, you know, this is going to be posted everywhere. Um, whenever there does need to be more information shared, we will certainly do so. I do anticipate that we will probably several times a week at this point be getting updates from the health departments and from the CDC. And I would encourage you to follow those as well. All right. Well, to your health. I hope everything is well with you and I look forward to presenting to you guys again. Have a nice day.